And then, like, Herbie comments, yeah, he called me fat, too. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to the channel, guys. I'm here with John Story, and we're going to talk about one of his favorite Benson tunes from an album that you guys probably haven't heard. Mm -hmm. We're going to break it down. We're going to discuss some of the licks and really just get into the history of this track that you guys probably haven't heard. So, Well, before we even play the track, you know, one thing that it's been so fun to get to hang with Chase because we both have a major love for, for George Benson's playing. I mean, yeah. he was the first jazz guitarist I ever heard. I was lucky my mom actually gave me this recording that we're about to talk talk about. Um, after I got the seat in my jazz band and she's like, okay, here's an example of jazz guitar. Yeah. And I was so enthralled with his tone and what seemed like the most clean, bright, brilliant phrases. It was, it, it just, it, it struck me like a lightning mm -hmm. bolt at first. I'm sure, you know, you felt the same the first time you heard George. Yeah, no, I mean, just listening to him, like, like you said, for me, it's always been like his mix of jazz and blues and, and the way that he always sounds like George Benson on it. Anything that he's on, it's like yeah. he's the most recognizable. When you hear guitar, it's like you know exactly who it is. Yeah, and even today in t this in this day and age that we're in, the bar that George set is so high for guitar players. Mm. As Pat Metheny said, even if he wouldn't have played a note on guitar and would have just sang, he would have had just as big of an impact on the music world because, yeah. of course, he's such an amazing vocalist. But let's play this track, and I'm curious how many people who are watching the video have heard this before because it actually is kind of a more rare um, Benson record that wasn't available for a long time in the transition from CDs into downloads and streams. It, was, it wasn't it was on Apple Music for a while. Cool. So, yeah, just tell me when to pause. Yeah. Stella by Starlight. Pause it right there before we get to the yeah. solo. So, okay, the great classic by Ned Washington, uh, Stella by Starlight. And uh, I think one thing we can all learn when we listen to George play that is how clear he plays the melody, mm -hmm. right? And and it, it's like he's singing it in a way, right? So he's got that lick that starts the melody, and then the horns have that little response that... So right away he's getting some inflection on the melody, but immediately after that, and then he adds the little chord punch in there that matches the horns. I mean, it's it's just so clear. George comes from that school where the melody is so important, and he wants the listener. Who you know, this is a this is a big record mm -hmm. that you know this is people that aren't just jazz musicians listening to this, and he wants that melody to be be really clear. Yeah, he has such a nice bounce. That's what I was noticing when he's playing the melody. It's like very clear, but he's he's like really emphasizing each of that. Yeah. The arc of the melody. Exactly. Yeah. And just a little background so far before we get into the solo. So. This is Stella by Starlight off of the album Tenderly, okay? And Tenderly was released on Warner Brothers in 1989, mm -hmm. and it's produced by the great Tommy LaPuma, okay? And recorded by the engineer, the amazing engineer Al Schmidt, okay? And for those who know a little bit of Benson's history, Tommy LaPuma is a very important producer to George, right, mm -hmm. Chase? Yeah, he was one of the first guys responsible for, you know, the reason that we all have heard of George Benson, getting him to sing and really... You know, the whole Breeze and album. Exactly. Because that was also on Warner Brothers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, 1989, um, it was an interesting year in jazz. I mean, that is like right when Wynton Marsalis is releasing Standard Time. It's sure. when the kind of the young lions are starting to come up. But also movies like When Harry Met Sally came out. Um, Harry Connick Jr. did the music to that. And jazz was sort of getting a mainstream appeal at that time. And what was really cool was Warner Brothers, major, major label, on the, on the level today of a Sony or Interscope at that time, 
um, they were putting a lot of money and advertising into records like this um, to, so that it would get out into the to the main populace. And here it is, an instrumental track mm -hmm. where he's not singing yeah, on this, true. which is kind of interesting, right? Because a lot of, of course, we think of a lot of more mainstream jazz that was recorded in the 90s, like Diana Krall. You know, she's, of course, Diana Krall, great singer, great pianist, great ensemble player, but she's singing on yeah. everything, right? Yeah, and especially because the other songs on this album even are other standards, other... Yeah. We didn't mention yet who else is on this track, on this album, right? Right. So I was trying to remember bass-wise because I looked in the liner notes and all music says it's Ron Carter. I thought it might be a different bass player. For mm -hmm. sure it's Herlin Riley on drums who ended up playing in Lincoln Center. Great drummer. And the great McCoy Tyner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's really cool in that intro you hear McCoy comp with those beautiful block chord voicings mm -hmm. that have those stacked fourths in there. Yeah. And George, I think, on this recording, as we get into this solo, he kind of solos a little differently mm -hmm. and plays some really interesting lines because he's playing with, with McCoy yeah. Yeah. on there. And there is one other instrumental track on this record. They do I Could Write a Book, and George does that beautiful solo guitar version of Tenderly, mm -hmm. which is the solo version he tends to play a lot. There's a lot of clips of him playing that same thing with his thumb, yeah. which is just amazing. Uh, but let's, why don't we play the uh, yeah. solo? That's a little bit of background on this. So this is Tenderly from 1989 on Warner Brothers, and the track is Stella by Starlight. Yeah. If we press play, we'll probably be right on this opening lick that we're going to have to check out. Yeah, we'll stop almost Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, yeah. Yeah, this is my favorite opening little lick to... Yeah, you can even roll songs. it back a little yeah. bit if you want to give us a, oh, a, well. some context. All right, here we go. Woo, yeah, pause that. So let's check that out. So the break, we've had this beautiful melody, okay? Then all of a sudden... So let's check out that lick. What do we have? We have the G blues scale. Boppy kind of like so we're kind of in the G pentatonic so we got that like a straight note chaser almost I can even get that swipe a little bit a little better George does a lot of that yeah that's like one of my favorite little yeah, and he's getting that both from Charlie Parker, but also some Char Charlie Christian played like mm -hmm. that too. And it's interesting. I, I feel like there's one guitarist who George sounds a lot like on this recording because we all know George is a disciple of Wes and Grant mm -hmm. Green. We hear a lot of that, but I think he sounds a lot like Hank Garland on this mm -hmm. recording too. Have you checked out Hank yeah, Garland? Yeah. Like for those who haven't checked out Hank Garland. Um, he uh, there's a record he did called Jazz Winds from a New Direction yeah. with a young Gary Burton yeah. on vibes and a lot of people don't give George enough connection to Hank because Hank did a lot of these bebopish mm -hmm. kind of lines. Hank's burning on that album. Oh yeah. man, yeah, yeah, and that cover of him in the convertible yeah. Yeah. with all the vintage Gibsons yeah. and stuff. It's you know he, yeah. Hank Garland, of course, famous for Jingle Bell Rock. Yeah. You know, he was the guy that did the intro. Yeah. That's, that's Hank Garland, too. But here I hear more Hank Garland than I hear even Grant and Wes, in a way. But that yeah. opening lick is just so great. Let's get into yeah. the rest of the solo here. Melodic minor. Melodic minor. Pause that right there. So... So he kind of resolves that part. There's that look again. There's the C minor. It's just, the, 
but just like the taste mm -hmm. of him choosing where he uses melodic minor in there, outlining the chords. Everything is like right in the right in the pocket. Yeah. <laughs> So clean, you know. Now check out this lick. Pause that right there. So was that. So that lick right there, we've got. that right there is kind of a grand, green kind of um, enclosure outline yeah. so what's that right there right melodic minor okay and that's kind of over that F7 so the whole lick is this Is it better than me? <laughs> woo. You can't you can't not say like a, a woo right after yeah, it's, like, it's just like automatic. <laughs> and the clarity, you know, again, like something I don't know about you, when when you started and playing jazz, mm -hmm. did you have a tendency to like pick really heavily when playing? Because for me, the tendency was to dig in yeah. a lot. Yeah, definitely. And, yeah, and when when you really get into this music and you hear how George is playing, mm -hmm. and of course we've got such great footage now. I mean, back when I learned heard this first, there wasn't YouTube yet. Mm -hmm. It was 1998, so there was just the recording. Yeah. But the videos of George, how he picks with the back of the pick yeah. like that, like our buddy Dan Wilson yeah. too, and just that clarity that he gets, and he's not digging in hard, mm -hmm. and there's just there's a lightness to it. It's like he's playing saxophone. Yeah. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Now this lick we also have to check out. Woo, pause that. I mean, I don't even know what he's playing right there. There's some kind of altered going to like the G. Another augmented lick. Yeah. Solves it with a blues yeah. lick. Ah. Yeah. Listen back to that one more time. Right here. Another melodic minor. Yeah. Let's keep 
listening. Enclosure. Pause that. That right there is, I think, George playing these, like, these, he's playing these fours. Yeah. And I think the reason he's playing that is because they've been in the studio all day. No doubt they've done other takes of this tune. McCoy is playing, I'm sure he's playing an idea like that. Yeah. Kind of inspired by what McCoy's playing. I don't know if you'd agree or anything, but... Yeah. yeah, no, that's cool. I, yeah. I in in a lot of the other souls, I don't notice Benson using force in that same kind of way. Yeah, that's, that's not his normal sort no. of line language. And it's so clear. Uh, scroll back just yeah. a little bit to hear that, and then yeah. Enclosure. Woo! <laughs> and then, yeah. Yeah. And then he ends, yeah, he ends his solo the... just like a little clean bow tie. Yeah. Yeah, and, and notice like his eighth note feel, it's so swinging, but it's mm -hmm. driving. Mm -hmm. I feel like you listen to Herlin Riley's ride cymbal and it's just, he's pushing everything. So yeah. I, it kind of gives it away for me that they probably were in the studio when they recorded this. I bet you they had done a couple takes before that. And knowing George and these mm -hmm. guys and how records were done back then with with producers like Tommy LaPuma, he probably said, why don't you guys record you know, this take and then these horn parts that we hear at the intro were probably added later, mm. is my right. assumption. Yeah. Like all those little, when George plays the little passing chord uh -huh. and the horns match it, yeah. my assumption is they were like, that's a great take, let's get somebody to come in and add some horns to it. Because there's also horns and there's a whole string orchestra on several tracks that's a good point. on this on yeah. this record. Yeah. yeah. I never thought of that. How about we keep listening, let's check out McCoy's solo now. Yeah, so we can write into yeah, that. And then they do some trading, which is out of sight. That phrasing is so great. Right here. Classic McCoy timer. Pedal. See, they probably added these horns later. Yeah. It might be Ron on bass. Yeah. It has that tone to it. Great solo. Okay, now here George comes in and takes another chorus before the melody. Totally burning line right here. Blues. Blues over the whole last set of chord changes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that, you know, for those who don't know Stella, the last set of chord changes, we have a cycle of two fives. And then here they do. In fact, on the recording, the way they started off. So they kind of do this 2-5. Okay, so they're doing that on, on the turnaround at the end. And George is just playing. He's just playing our, playing blues scale over the whole thing. So It's funny because actually in my uh, Guitar Academy yesterday, yeah. someone was asking, like, are bends jazz? Like, I ha. like to bend, but, you know, I've seen some stuff where bends aren't 
considered jazz and well you know it is a good question because you know why did coltrane a lot of saxophone players in the 60s not use a lot of vibrato because mm -hmm. it wasn't really in vogue you know the saxophone players of of yesteryear had used a ton of vibrato so mm -hmm. the, the more modern sound is a straight tone and for guitar players though we listen to charlie christian he's bending notes mm -hmm. and if charlie christian's doing yeah. it i mean that's our that's our roots with this instrument of course but um, yeah, and also it's context too, because mm -hmm. if you're somebody who plays with a really, really light set of strings and you're doing really wide bending mm -hmm. all the time, especially like in and out of your targeting notes, mm -hmm. then in jazz, what we often do is we don't do that, we enclose the note. Mm -hmm. So instead of me going, you know, even though George does that a little bit, yeah. here we go. We create a bebop line which creates the effect that we're surrounding that note. So yeah. it's not that we can't bend, and George is showing us here that we can, but that's, again, I think that's coming from some Hank Garland stuff, because mm -hmm. Hank did a lot of bending in his bebop soloing, too. Yeah, yeah, I like to think about it that it's tying into the blues with the history of jazz and like yeah. bringing in some of the blues elements to, and no one does it better than Benson in that, in yeah. that context. A couple other funny things about this recording, too. Um, is um, in fact play it play let's play the ending now because okay. the lick he does at the end I it's one of those things like I almost don't want to learn it because if I learned it I would play this all the time uh -huh. it's like it's too hallowed to yeah. do that I just yeah. I just love listening to this lick so <laughs> let's play the head out and listen to the last cadenza on it cool again clear melody Nothing is getting in the way of the melody, right? <laughs> then he starts filling here as they tag the end, right? crazy good there's so many great live recordings of this band at the time they did a tour um there's some footage on youtube of mm -hmm. them and mccoy is in it i think avery sharp is playing um bass um i can't remember who else is is in the band mm -hmm. um but mccoy did the tour and they did stella yeah and they did also alligator boogaloo and some other stuff mm -hmm. so that's fun to check out but i would love oh gosh i wish I could go to the Warner Brothers archives and pull the can out from this session and listen to the other takes because I bet mm -hmm. you there was other takes yeah. of that. They also do, like I said, I could write a book. Yeah. And then they do Here, There, and Everywhere, like Beatles tune. Um, and George sings on a lot. Uh, he does a beautiful tune called um, This Is All I Ask. Okay. And it's just gorgeous ballad. And he, he really only sings on mm -hmm. that. Um, but yeah, this record, Tenderly, I think it's one of the most underrated Benson records. Of course, we all love all of his early stuff and then his pop stuff, but it's an interesting record because he was super famous by this point. He was a pop star on the level of Luther Vandross and mm -hmm. Peebo Bryson and filling stadiums playing like that. That's crazy. You know? It is. Different time. Yeah. Different time. And of course, then Warner Brothers ended up becoming reprise records and none such records. They all kind of formed into each conglomerate. Warner Brothers is still around, but um, jazz was a major part of their catalog at this time and it was also amazing how labels were funding and putting out major projects like that and putting an instrumental track I mean mm -hmm. I can't even like I could imagine the only person who could get away with it today in the pop sphere would be maybe John Mayer could mm -hmm. do like a one instrumental track on a record and they would be like cool that's yeah. good but this was this was common and people people listen to this record so yeah. it's one of my favorites Awesome, guys. I hope you enjoyed that breakdown of this Stella by Starlight with George Benson. If you guys want to check out more from John's story, we have some videos on this channel as well as his chord melody course. So just check out the links in the description. You'll find everything you need there. Yep. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Don't bring your pick to the chord melody thing. You won't need it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see ya. See ya.